How to be 100% sure you're going to heaven and not be surprised in hell. Allow me to read you the story of the rich man and Lazarus. What I want you to take note of is the speed in which his transition from this world into hell was. Luke chapter 16 verse 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Verse 22 and 23 is what I want to focus on for just one moment. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. In an instant, the rich man woke up in Hades. Words cannot describe the complete and utter shock the rich man experienced. He was quite literally living the high life one second, and a moment later, he was in Hades. I am sure that he was surprised to see where he was. And the unfortunate thing is a lot of people will also be surprised where they spend eternity. It is a sobering thought. How close we are to eternity. As humans, we live with this false sense of security that eternity is a million miles away, but there is but a step between either heaven or hell. Now the question, how to be 100% sure I am going to heaven and not be surprised in hell? The answer is Jesus. Mark chapter 8 verse 36 to 38. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. A man can hardly gain the whole world. And if he gains it, the Bible says it will profit nothing to him if he loses his soul thereafter. There is nothing in this world that anyone can give in exchange for his soul. Pursuing the things of this world will only result to vain toils. But when a person has Jesus, he gets satisfied even with whatever little possession he has. 
When you have Jesus, you can sleep at night with the assurance of where you are going. What more can a person ask for than to know that one day I am going to heaven? One day I am going to be with Jesus. One day I am going to walk on the streets of pure gold. When you have Jesus, you have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What more can a person ask for than to have peace with God? I am okay with this world hating me. I am okay with society being angry with me. I am okay with being an outcast and the world not being at peace with me. But there's one person I want peace with, is God. Now that is amazing. Being at peace with the one who holds my next breath. Now that is amazing. Being at peace with the one who holds my next heartbeat in his hands. Now that is amazing. Being at peace with the one who has the whole world in his hands. I am glad. I am glad that I have peace with God through Jesus Christ. God is smiling at me. God is is pleased with me. I sleep better knowing that at night that God and I are at peace with one another. Jesus is the answer. Wealth does not satisfy. Fame does not satisfy. Power will not save a person's soul from being lost. There is a reality beyond this physical realm where the things of this world are valueless. Your political status on earth will not bail you out when you die. You cannot buy heaven with the stacks of your bank account. Your fame on earth will not give you an audience in heaven. Jesus is the answer. He is the only one that can make your life count after this world. And He is the only one who can bring peace between you and God. Not one person enters heaven without being at peace with God. Life on earth is short, but God promised us eternal bliss, which no one can access outside of Christ. Jesus is the answer for the world today. There is no salvation in any other apart from Christ. A life without Christ is a life in crisis. What are you seeking for in Christ? The peace you need is in Christ. The satisfaction you long for is in Christ. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 commands us to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first, then all other things will be added to us. The answer that unlocks all other things is Jesus Christ. You can never get the other things if you don't have Christ. Unbelievers could have wealth, but they do not have satisfaction. Being wealthy can raise your standard of living but it can't grant you peace with God. The rich man in Luke chapter 16 verse 19 through 31 closed his eyes in death and opened it to an eternal reality where he saw his wretchedness. He learned that Jesus is the answer only when it was too late to repent. His appeal was that someone would go from paradise to warn his relatives this message is directly such kind of warning. Jesus is all you need. Whatever you do on earth, outside of Christ will perish in this world. Let Jesus guide your life. Let him be your Lord and Savior. Live for him here on earth so that you can live with him there in eternity. The greatest problem of humanity is sin. 
Romans chapter 3 verse 23 affirms that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin reduces a man and unfortunately the human nature is depraved and helpless. The blood of animals were used in the Old Testament to atone for the sins of people, but the life of a goat or a ram or a bull cannot substitute for the life of a man. Man was wallowed for a long time in sin without anyone to help. We are all sinners alike, and we couldn't help ourselves. Sin is a plague that corrupted the entire human race. No doctor can prescribe drug for a thief, a fornicator, or a murderer. But we find the solution to the problem of sin in the person of Jesus Christ. The question of sin was answered by him. Jesus is the answer. Romans chapter 10 verse 11 through 13 says, The scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation from sin oppressions of darkness in Satan, sickness and affliction are guaranteed in Christ. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 verse 15 And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We live in a world where the fear of God is declining sharply. One of the causes of this malady is bad parenting. Joshua told the Israelites, to make a choice between God and the idols which their fathers had served. But as for him, he made a public declaration that he and his family will serve the Lord. The Israelites served strange gods and idols, and they left their children with such an evil option. Today, we also have our choices to make. We have to decide who we are going to serve God, or idols. These idols don't necessarily have to be physical statues erected somewhere. They could be anything we cherish and exalt above God in our lives. Dare to be like Joshua, who said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the day for you to make a commitment that I don't care what happens next door. I don't care what happens in the senator's office, but what I do care about is my home. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Make a commitment to serve the Lord. Make a commitment to be obedient to the Lord. One thing you need to know and remember about the Lord is that the Lord recognizes obedience. And not only does he recognize obedience, he rewards obedience. John 14 verse 15 If ye love me, keep my commandments. A very short verse, but very powerful. Allow your home and your family to be a home and family built on obedience to the word of God, because foundationally, that is what the Christian faith requires, obedience unto the Lord. In the midst of a generation that is sinful, in the midst of a generation full of lawlessness, make a commitment that for me, as a father or mother, each and every one of my family members will serve the Lord. Don't allow this world to raise your children. No one loves your children like you do. No one cares for your children like you do. Don't allow the TV to raise your children. Don't allow social media to raise your children. Make time for children. Teach them the Word of God. 
Allow them to know the goodness of the Lord. Show them with your life what being born again truly looks like. We can choose to make a difference in this generation where people have little or no regard for God. We can make such a commitment that Joshua made. He was not only going to serve the Lord as an individual, he was going to ensure that everyone in his house also serve the Lord. You know hell is real. You know it is. And you know you are going to heaven. But imagine how you feel if you are the only person in your family to go to heaven. Don't give up on your family. Even if you have a child that has walked away from the Lord and wants absolutely nothing to do with the Lord, keep praying for them. Keep putting them on the altar. God still answers prayers. Don't give up on backslidden family members. Your child may be lost in the world. Your husband or wife may hate the fact that you love the Lord and the very subject of God may start an argument in your household. But I encourage you to pray for them. Keep praying for them. There is a lady I used to pastor and she spoke about how her husband hated the fact she went to church and the conversation of church or God would start an argument in their house. She used to always ask the church to pray that her husband may be born again, to pray that her husband may believe in the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Now before I continue with this story, I want you to know that God works in mysterious ways. Although she couldn't minister to him because it would start an argument, God began to send people into her husband's life, people who kept ministering to him one by one. And over the course of years, one day, he came to church and was born again. Don't give up on your family members to be saved. You may have a child in jail right now. They can be saved in that jail cell. You know hell is real. You know it is. And you know you are going to heaven. But imagine how you will feel if you were the only person in your family to go to heaven. Make it your mission to ensure that not one relative of yours goes to hell. The thought of relatives in hell should make you pray for those that you know are lost in your family. If you are not serving the Lord wholeheartedly, it will be difficult for you to make your household to serve him. The God you do not know can hardly be shown to others. Choosing to serve the Lord is a commitment. It is a deliberate decision that must be acted upon. I believe strongly that we can make such a decision and find its reality in homes in this perverse generation. Declare boldly to yourself, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lot and his family were living in a city where sexual immorality was prevalent, but he could raise his two daughters in the same land as virgins. Say again to yourself, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No matter how much this generation derails from the righteous standard of God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Dare to be like Abraham, concerning whom the Lord testified in Genesis 18 verses 17 to 19, saying, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God did not hide his plans from Abraham, not only because he was righteous, but more so because God knew that Abraham would teach his household in the fear of the Lord. Can God testify about you, that you and your house will serve him? The greatest heritage that parents should pass on to their children is the fear of the Lord. 
You and your house can be a threat to the devil and a great example for others to emulate in this end time. It is when you and your house have made a commitment to serve the Lord that you and your family will become a sign and wonder to the world, according to Isaiah 8 verse 18, which says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. As a child of God, you need to make a commitment that God will reign in your home and have control over everyone around you. In Acts 10, Cornelius was said to be a God-fearing man. When he had an encounter with the angel who instructed him to send for Peter, he gathered his whole household and used his influence to gather the band of soldiers under him to listen to the word of God. Cornelius was saved alongside with his household and the soldiers under him were not left out too. They all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can be the reason revival will break forth in your family. Yes, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is not a group decision, but you lead your family to follow Christ. You can compel everyone in your house to comply with God's standard through your consistent intercession. I'd like you to prophesy boldly now and say, I take responsibility to bring my household into God's service. I prophesy that my family will seek God. As for me and my house, we will worship God in spirit and in truth. As for me and my family, we will walk in holiness and righteousness. As for me and my house, we are dedicated, sanctified, and separated for God's honorable use. As for me and my house, we are for signs and wonders. There's nothing more profitable to a man and his house if they are dedicated to a lifetime service of the Most High God. Exodus 23 verses 25 to 26 says concerning those who will commit themselves to the service of God, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. When Joshua publicly declared that he and his house will serve the Lord, he knew that serving God and leading his house in the way of the Lord attracted divine blessings. Every parent should do well to bring up their children in the way of the Lord. Any child that is being raised in the atmosphere of God will grow to become the joy of his parents. You and your family can be the delight of God's heart in this end time.